Shalom, my name is Randy Weiss, and I want to welcome you to a weird edition of Crosstalk. So as to live up to the description of this program, today's message is tentatively entitled, Roman Flatulence in Occupied Ancient Israel. Dwell on that for a moment. Whereas I usually discuss particularly Christian stuff or fascinatingly Jewish stuff, whoopee! As you can tell from the title of this message, today you will get it all. And I will also bring it home for any red, white, and blue patriots in my audience. In case there are any flaming liberals, cockeyed communists, or pathetic politicians that are watching, I have subtitled this episode just for you. A part heard round the world. Even those of their ilk should be able to grasp the flavor of this message. Take notes, I promise to provide you with a history lesson that may clear the room. As a minimum, it will clear some of the fog of history. And since I won't have seen this before it is completed for public consumption, and I won't be with you when you view it, allow me to apologize in advance for anything my producers do to enhance the graphics for this program. Sometimes they just act like seventh grade boys instead of college graduates who get to play with highly sophisticated TV production software. Additionally, since our producers don't get paid much, I am required to let them have fun when they play with their toys and help me tell my stories. Therefore, in this episode, they have been turned loose to make the program and our podcast understandable to all, including any liberals, communists, or politicians who may tune in. I'll talk slowly. I think it important that American history and the history of ancient Israel is taught to all classes of people in the manner that best communicates the message. So, I have identified at least one interesting similarity between the Jews of the New Testament era and the earliest citizens of the original 13 British colonies that came to be known as America. This is a serious discussion that takes us back to colonial Boston during the month of April in 1775. An English commander had been sent with a detachment of trained British troops to Lexington and Concord. Their mission was to take control of a cache of gunpowder their orders also required them to capture the rebel leaders, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. My friends, these gents were more than a brand of beer or a synonym for a signature. These were two of the ringleaders of the colonial rebellion. By the way, do you know the difference between a rebellion and a revolution? In a rebellion, the losers get hanged and the winners go back to England for tea and crumpets, followed by a parade. A revolution is really a rebellion where the rebels win, and their prize includes not being hanged. But if they live through the war, they are required to build a nation. Then they name a beer after you. I find that very odd, because if history and marketing were honest, instead of a beer, they would have named a tea company after Samuel Adams. You see, he was the guy responsible for the Boston Tea Party. You remember that event, right? A bunch of guys dressed up like Indians probably got drunk and dumped an entire ship's cargo of tea into Boston Harbor. Well, actually, since they were risking their lives by destroying all that tea owned by the British, they probably waited until after the party to get drunk so they could avoid being murdered by the redcoats or falling off the boat before they fell off the wagon, if you know what I mean. I guess I should also make sure we all understand what the Boston Tea Party was. So as not to be presumptuous, since there might be a few flaming liberals, communists, or politicians still staying tuned to get an address to send their hate mail, the Boston Tea Party was not tea and crumpets. It was not a social gathering of the Boston upper crust. It was one of America's first 
bold, successful political protests of enormous proportions. The Boston Tea Party taught the world what a successful protest looks like. Get your crayons out if you want my address to send that hate mail. They didn't loot the Apple store, they didn't burn the police station, and they didn't cry like overindulged, overentitled, spoiled pansies that cry when a conservative speaks the truth near one of their overpriced campuses so the pansies can flock to their deluded lecture halls to get their indoctrination and emotional support from their communist professors for as long as their parents will pay their tuition. Nope. The guys at the Boston Tea Party set the bar for a real protest. If you were also gone that day in school, I think it is at least safe to assume most of you will recall the more recent conservative American political movement that rose up during the Obama era presidency. They were known as the Tea Party, and they were heavily right-leaning American patriots who believed their taxes were too high and they weren't fairly represented in Washington. Now look, don't get your undies in a wad over this. I'm not suggesting everything the Tea Party Republicans did was perfect or everything Obama did was terrible. Frankly, I don't care. I just want us to understand the Tea Party guys got their name from the good work done by Samuel Adams. Not the beer, the patriot of the American Revolution. The King of England had heavily taxed the American colonists. The colonists were tired of England's heavy-handed tactics and crushing taxation. Everyone has heard the old expression, no taxation without representation. That came from our boys who were riled about what happened at Lexington, Concord, Boston, and Philadelphia, everywhere where England flexed their muscles over our limited freedoms. The colonists believed it was unconscionable that England should tax Americans when Americans had no voice in England's system of government. They were totally ignored. Many protests in the colonies led to the king removing most of the taxes to avoid constant conflict from the pesky Americans. <laughs> we were a problem for England. And you should know, that protests can be both patriotic and successful, but not like we sometimes see in our messed up society today. For example, let me tell you something that I find appalling. Once again, get your crayons to send me that hate mail. In light of dozens of Americans having been wounded, killed, or kidnapped by Hamas terrorists, and with thousands of innocent Israelis also wounded killed or kidnapped in the same terrorist attack. Don't you find it pathetic that brainwashed liberal college students and racist Democrat Congresswomen who hate Israel, hate the Jews, and probably hate many Americans, fill the streets and social media to demonstrate against the only Democratic ally that America has in the Middle East? What's up with that? I'm delighted that they have the freedom to exhibit their outright ignorance or intentional disregard for truth, but it is nevertheless appalling that they just don't know any better or cannot get out of their own way to make a rational point. But I must get back to my point. I'm not here to talk about politics. I must return to the King of England just prior to the American Revolution. King George III, remember him, he had wisely removed most of the taxes that had caused the unrest in the colonies. In fact, he only let one tax remain, and that was minimal. It was just to maintain the right to tax his subjects in the colonies. That one tax that he kept was the tax on, you guessed it, tea. So a shipload of tea suddenly arrived in Boston. It was supposed to be landed and taxed according to the current laws. The king was certain that he had outwitted the unsophisticated colonists. He had lowered the cost of tea to the colonies below the cost of any tea that they could import through the black markets. He reduced the price to 
make it less than the original cost of tea, even after the little bit of tax was added to it. And he had placed such a minimal tax on the tea that he was certain he could keep his right to tax in place by slipping the tea in under the economic radar of the day. But good King George hadn't taken Samuel Adams into account. Okay, I gotta tell you, Samuel Adams did try his hand at brewing beer, but he went bankrupt and everyone forgot about that debacle. Whereas his tea party is remembered by patriots and tax-hating citizens everywhere. But if you prefer his beer, we can still be friends. And by the way, we can still be friends, even if you're a liberal, anti-Semitic college knucklehead living on the dole of your parents or in their basement after graduation. Remember, use lined paper for your crayons when you write to me. I do prefer proper spelling and grammar, so consult your one token conservative friend before hitting send or licking the stamp. And if it's about the beer, please enjoy it in moderation and give somebody your keys before you imbibe. Most important, Remember, it is no longer politically correct to dress up like Indians and cause trouble. It makes our indigenous people look bad, and there are other ways to protest high taxes today, such as, hmm, let's think about it, voting for the party of lower taxes and explaining economics to your communist friends. <clears throat> but getting back to the differences between rebellions and revolutions, one other difference is that the winners write the history books so they get to color the events like they want future generations to interpret the events. Plus, they don't get hung. Remember, Benedict Arnold was only a traitor because England lost. He would have been the hero if things had gone differently. England would have named a colony after him. Instead, no self-respecting American would name their cat after him. Well, I might because of my attitude toward cats, but that's a different story and wouldn't do much to increase our viewership or our pleasant repartee on social media. Just in case you were gone from school the day your history teacher discussed Benedict Arnold, he was a highly respected American general during the revolution. George Washington trusted him so deeply that Benedict Arnold was put in charge of West Point. Arnold made a secret deal with the British to surrender West Point, but his plot was discovered and he became known as one of America's most hated traitors. But everything must be kept in perspective. The British, well, they paid him a handsome sum and made him a brigadier general in the army that lost. I guess he could have also served the French who rarely won a war or anything requiring soldiers except perhaps some, I don't know, some girly uniform red carpet catwalk awards. Before people from across Europe begin to hate me, I want to get back to the topic of the revolution. It was at Lexington. You remember Lexington and Concord? April 1775, where the American soldiers were later memorialized as the Minutemen. These were the guys who were ordered to disperse by the British Redcoats. They didn't move fast enough, and shots were fired, killing eight Americans, better known at that time as colonists. The maddened Americans stood up, fought back, and forced the British to retreat at Concord. It was a big deal. It was a historic moment. Some might call it the beginning of a nation. Ralph Waldo Emerson immortalized the event in a famous poem, The Concord Hymn. He wrote, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Please remember this passage. It is well known. The shot heard round the world. You might wonder why this is relevant to a message about the Jewish origins of the church. Well, it goes like this, and I'm finally getting to my real point. Ancient Israel was an occupied land dominated by Rome, in much the same way that colonial America was an occupied land dominated by England. 
I trust you can begin to see the similarities when viewed in this context. World powers have the might and propensity to do things like colonize, tax, enslave, dominate, repress, oppress, or suppress. The early churchmen were embroiled in a rebellion, much like the founding fathers of the great nation of America. You should know that many Jewish patriots also fought in the American Revolution, and this probably helped change the course of American hatred of the Jews, because America hated the Jews. In case you are unaware, I'll mention that in 1649, the Colonial Act of Toleration, as it was called, was enacted in America. The name is a misnomer, like many things put through by politicians. The 1649 Act of Toleration literally declared death to Jews and atheists. I wrote about it in one of my books about 30 years ago. Ugly stuff. It's worth noting that according to John Adams, only about one third of the residents of colonial America supported our revolution. But many of the Jewish citizens did. And it is my opinion, and other historians would agree, that America may have lost the revolution were not for some of its Jewish citizens being involved. But the point about John Adams' comment that one third of the colonial Americans supported the revolution, it means that only uh, it was a small minority. Two thirds of the colonists, the great majority, were opposed to American independence. I wrote about that too. But actually, in my view, they probably weren't so much opposed to independence as they were against the high cost of life and property to gain that independence. Life is usually that way. Everybody wants the benefits of freedom, but few wish to pay the price. Christianity is much the same. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Our fathers in the faith were revolutionaries in their own way. Similarly, the great rabbis of ancient Judaism were also revolutionaries. Unlike the American Revolution, the Jewish revolts and the Christian Revolution did not lead to the glory of those in the battles. By and large, they just died for their beliefs. Modern Jews and modern Christians, on the other hand, are the true beneficiaries of their bravery and commitment. Therefore, I do see many similarities to colonial America and the early church. And I want to help you return to the scene of the crime and reconstruct a portion of the New Testament era for anyone in the audience who is interested in legitimate history. I wish to take you back to the world that birthed the literature we call holy. The culture, the language, the idioms, the contemporary literature of the nation, and the people who produced our New Testament did not exist in a vacuum. First century Israel, like 17th and 18th century America, was a bit of an apocalyptic era. But in ancient Israel, the era was rife with messianic expectations. Their oppression allowed them to be consumed with a hunger for hope. Many wanted to see God bring their promised redemption. The powerful and the powerless were in what must have seemed to be a life and death struggle. The New Testament book, known as the Acts of the Apostles, details the first 30 years of Christianity. From this book, we learn how the church grew and developed after the death of Jesus. Yes, Christ died in the Gospels, but the story wasn't over. After his glorious resurrection, Jesus still had more to say. And it feels good to remember that in any red letter edition of the Bible, turn to the book of Acts, you're still going to see that there's red ink identifying the living words of our living Savior. The New Testament is more than a last will and testament or the final words from a dying man. It was not an epitaph. It is a living legacy. The men and women in the book of Acts didn't worship at a graveside. 
The tomb became the womb from which Christianity emerged, becoming the most vibrant world movement in the history of man. If we round off the details and do fuzzy math, we can suggest that Jesus died around the year 30. We can say that the Acts of the Apostles might have taken us through the year 60 A.D. And no mention is made of the destruction of the temple which occurred in 70 A.D. For those who talk about a, a late writing of the New Testament, certainly the destruction of the temple would have been included in the narrative had it occurred after 70 A.D. Neither is there any discussion of the Roman persecution of Christians that came around the year 64 A.D. Therefore, it is generally believed that the book of Acts was probably written about 62 A.D. These defining moments of the first century church teach us a lot about the heart of the Jewish believers who began Christianity and carried it into the early stages of it becoming a world religion. Nonetheless, I want to look beyond the New Testament to another contemporary source of information from that age. I want to focus briefly on a passage from Josephus. It is from the text of this ancient Jewish historian that I've generated the title for this message. Some Christian programming might seem like pablum or nourishment made for babies in the faith. Having served on a seminary faculty, consider this brief episode to be a college-level lecture to feed adults and thinking Christians. Obviously, it also serves to aggravate those who think I'm a Jewish lunatic. I am not. But you have my address and your crayons. As I'm nearing the end of this little exercise, I do need to explain the title that I mentioned at the start. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot it down for inclusion in your hate mail so I know which episode caused your mindless rant. As I'd mentioned, it is called Roman Flatulence in Occupied Ancient Israel. For my creative production staff, they preferred my working title, which carried the essence of the message more in line with the thematic introduction of the American Revolution, borrowing from Emerson's landmark poem, we called it The Fart, Heard Round the World, for TV and social media purposes, of course. I wanted to run a poll, but we just agreed. The crayon crowd of the liberal arts Ivy League schools couldn't spell flatulence. A crisis did occur during the Book of Acts in the middle of the first century in Jerusalem. This is real. I'm not making this stuff up. But the apostles didn't mention anything about it in the New Testament, and that is also true. But it happened. The event happened after the death of Herod. A prefect named Cumanus was made procurator. In other words, he became the big boss after Herod. He served from about 48 to 52 AD. Cumanus ruled over a portion of the Roman province that included the area's capital city of Jerusalem. Josephus reported about a tragic moment during the Feast of Passover. Now you need to understand that countless throngs of pilgrims flooded Jerusalem every year during the biblical festival of Passover. Rome kept close watch during these pilgrimage festivals. They knew that when the annual crowds arrived from the distant reaches of the empire, problems could be incited by unhappy dominated Jewish colonists. They were pesky, just like the American colonists. The Roman soldiers were perched atop the portico of the temple. They were there as guards and deterrence to trouble. They stood on these high walls and they watched the crowds. Allow me to describe what happened, an event that launched a riot during that fateful Passover. I will quote the subject text of this message so it won't be lost on anyone. One of the soldiers pulled back his garment and cowering down after an indecent manner, turned his breech to the Jews and spoke such words as you might expect upon such a posture. If you're unable to picture this moment from the archaic language, a Mr. John J. Pilch, a professor, renders the text of Josephus 
more graphically. It makes it a bit easier to understand. He said, these soldiers were high on a wall over the pilgrims. He explained that the soldier turned his back to the Judeans, bent forward, raised his skirt in an indecent manner, and broke wind noisily while keeping his posture. That became the fart heard round the world. The event was a little bit like the one described by Emerson. The locals were angry. They rose up against their oppressors. They had been disrespected by the foreign colonizers' army. However, as we know, the outcome was rather different in colonial America. Eight patriots were killed before the turnaround at Concord and a successful revolution broke out in the colonies. In ancient Jerusalem, the unkind gesture of the Roman soldier led to a brief riot. There was a flurry of rock throwing that instantaneously brought down the wrath of Rome. The soldiers began driving pilgrims from the temple with such a rage that as the Jews ran for their lives, literally 10,000 Jewish citizens were crushed to death. Shortly thereafter, the entire nation mourned and grieved in unbelief. In a nutshell, bad things happened. Citizens reacted. Sometimes they win, and it's called a revolution. Sometimes they lose, and it's called a rebellion. And sometimes honest people know the difference between acts of rebellion, acts of revolution, and acts of terrorism. America had a revolution in 1776 led by patriots. Israel had revolts led by angry rabbis and followers of false messiahs in the first and second centuries. That's a story for another podcast, but what happened in Israel during 2023 was nothing less than one of the most despicable terrorist attacks that has ever happened. Anyone with a conscience, a brainstem, and a cell phone knows the difference. If you don't, shame on you. Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. What I really came here to say was pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Please, don't hate the Palestinians because of what the Hamas terrorists did. Innocent people of Israel and Gaza have suffered unconscionable things. They need our prayers, our understanding, and before this is over, they will all need our help. For any people of goodwill out there, thanks for listening. And I hope my abundant use of sarcasm provided a chuckle or two during these difficult days. Till next time, Shalom. By the way, the real title of this program is Revolution, Revolt, or just plain murderous terrorism. The world needs to learn the difference. God help us.